Hello my viewers, welcome to another Hexmanic Advanced Tutorial. This tutorial is Advanced Number 1, Working with Tables. Not those tables, but these tables. In this video I'm going to cover a lot of things. I'll explain what tables are in Hexmanic Advanced. I'll be talking about the various table formats. I'll show you how Hexmanic Advanced keeps track of tables. I will demonstrate editing existing tables. I'll show you how to access tables that may not be easy to find. I will tiptoe into the concept of linked tables. And lastly, I'll be showing you how to quote unquote repair tables if Hexmanic Advanced recognized them incorrectly. This is the first part of a two part tutorial. First, I'm going to explain what a table is in the context of Hexmaniac Advance. A table is an entity that contains game data in an ordered structure. They come in different shapes and sizes. HMA interprets these tables so that they are easier to follow and navigate. Right now you're looking at a table of most of the Pokemon's Crydata, and now you're looking at a list of pointers. More specifically, a list of pointers to code that gets ran when using special commands in your NPC scripts. Different tables have different numbers of elements, or indices, or items, whichever noun makes the most sense to you. And each of those have different fields, or attributes. This table here has a lot of items, and each item is just one pointer field. The previous table also had a lot of elements, but each element had a variety of fields that you could theoretically edit if you wanted to. I will now show you the basic table formats that Tables in Hexmanic Advance use, and I'll do this by making a table from scratch, starting at a random offset in free space. This table won't have an actual purpose in the game, but it will still be valuable, and I don't have to be bound by the constraints of practicality for this tutorial. Hold shift and press the 6 key to get a circumflex, and give the table a name, pretty much any name you want. For now, we can just click off and leave the name as it is. Now I can show you by clicking the Home button to go to the Go To menu. You'll see the name to the soon-to-be table in its own category. I can click that button to access this table. Now, most tables in the game, with a few exceptions, have their formatting encased in brackets, and they are placed right after the name. There's also a number afterwards to show how many elements or entries this table has. Inside these brackets, I'm going to define what makes an element of this table, like what fields or values that the user can edit. I'll start with four of them, and each one will reserve a different number of bytes in the ROM. I'll start by typing field A followed by a period. This reserves one byte. Next up is field B, which reserves two bytes after adding a colon. Then I type field C, followed by a combination of a period and a colon to reserve three bytes. And lastly, field D, two colons, four bytes. I will add more to this table later, but we'll stick to these four fields for now. If I click on any element in the table, you will see the four fields in the table panel on the left. You can edit them there or in the hex content viewer, which is on the right side. You should also pay attention to which element of the table or which index you are editing. All tables start at index 0 in Hexmanic Advance. You can press the previous and next buttons to cycle through the elements in the table. And to keep track of which element of the table you're editing, look at where my cursor is at right now. Although it is in small print, there is the name of the table followed by a forward slash and the ID of the index of the table you're editing. You need to look at this part of the table tool often, especially when you're working with Pokemon IDs, trainer IDs, item IDs, and much more. If you want to display a field in hexadecimal bytes instead of base 10, after the dot or colon in a number, hold shift and press backslash to get a vertical bar and type a lowercase h. You can now edit all of the field Ds and hexadecimal values as you please. By default, most of these numeric fields display numbers without negative signs, aka unsigned number formats, but you can change the range of numbers by doing vertical bar Z to get a signed value. You'll be able to see negative numbers, but the highest number you can input decreases nearly twofold. In this case, typing 128 actually gives me negative 128. Let's do some more. I'm going to show you two other table formats that are commonly used. 
and they're a bit more advanced. So the first thing I'm going to do is add another field which is dedicated to text. Each entry in the table will have its own text field and that's going to be at the start of every row. So here I type name and I use two double quotation marks. But since I'm editing a table and not random text that an NPC uses, I have to put a number afterwards to indicate how many bytes I'm going to be reserving for this text. This also includes a terminator ff byte, meaning that reserving 13 bytes of text only gives me the freedom to type a text string of 12 characters. In addition, I'm adding another field at the very end. In this field, we'll use a less than operator and a greater than operator, which will reserve four bytes that are specifically used as a pointer. I could use this four byte pointer for a lot of things, like pointers to images of different length, or pointers to descriptions, which can be a variable length, or pointers to scripts that NPCs use, or really anything that is located in a different part of the ROM. Let's fix this table. First, I'm going to give each text string a simple name, like item1, item2, etc. I can edit these values in the hex content viewer or in the table tool. And as you're about to see, to the left of the orange strings, you'll see that the row starts with item1, item2, etc. instead of an address in the ROM. That's a cool thing you can do when you have a text string as the first field of a table. I'm going to now replace these invalid pointers with pointers to, at first, addresses in the free space, and then addresses to named tables such as the Pokemon table and the ability names table. When I changed the table formatting, the raw data didn't change itself, so thus I'll need to make more changes to these four fields to get the values I actually want. Thus, if you end up making a table early in development, but then you realize you need to allocate more space to each table element, then it's going to be really tedious for you to edit each part of the table so that you have all the new fields while also having the original data for the other fields that got messed up due to moving data interpretations around. Now another thing you can do is copy one of the rows of data that's in this table and paste it right after the end of the table, like the first byte of free space that's not formatted. This won't work if you're trying to paste it somewhere else. Even if you deep copy, which basically puts more detailed information in your clipboard about the data you just copied. Now if you look closely at the successful paste, the table has been expanded so that there are now seven items, and I can edit its data freely. This trick also applies to level up moves. Here I'm going to go to Meter and Female's move set and I'll just copy a couple of its moves. As you saw, overriding existing move data caused the table to extend by one element in this case. I can open the data in the text tool and you will see all of the moves and their level in their tuple form. I could theoretically repeat this process indefinitely, although that wouldn't actually be practical in the case of level up moves. Quick note, since this table actually has Terminator FF bytes as indicated by the magenta brackets. Extending the table beyond those bytes will not work as you would expect. You'd have to extend at those magenta bytes or earlier in the table. This also applies to trainer data. Here I have a sailor with two Pikachu. I'm going to follow the pointer to his Pokemon data and I'm going to copy one of the elements. Afterwards, I'm going to go to the trainer below, Camper Liam, and access his Pokemon data by following his pointer. You see three total elements for three Pokemon, and now I'm going to paste at the first FF byte after the table, and you will see that the table extends. Now he has four Pokemon instead of three. If you try to paste the copy data to a different FF byte, one that's not right after the end of the table, you will just paste raw bytes that won't be of use to you. Here's one more thing I'm going to show you in the demonstration table. If you recall, field B just has a colon after it and nothing else. What I can do is put a name of a particular table after the colon and I can change the numbers to more specific data. I pasted the name of the table that has the list of nature names right after the colon and as you see, the field B column is colored turquoise and you're going to see some nature names instead of small numbers.
numbers that are outside the domain of the table, in this case the nature's names table, will just stay as numbers instead of words. If you look at the drop down menu on the table tool, you'll see all of the natures in the game, plus the 65,535 at the end. Let me adjust this table real quick. I can type in the names of the natures, or I can type in numbers that correspond to the IDs of those natures. As a side note, strings of text that have integer numbers assigned to them for a variety of purposes are called enumerations, or enums for short. All this time, I had this table called temporary name, and now I think it's appropriate to rename the table. So out of the four main categories, data, graphics, scripts, and sound, I'm going to choose to nest my table underneath the data subdirectory. This table does not fit in any of the subdirectories underneath the data subdirectory, so I'm going to make my own, as you will see. So in this table's anchor text box, I replace temporary name with data, followed by a period to separate subdirectories, then demonstrations, which is a new subdirectory, that will be nested, followed by another period, and I just type first, to give this table its unique special name. I'll show you other types of formatting that you'll find in other tables in the ROM. I'll take you to a table that I have not covered in one of my videos before, the Pokemon table. Let's analyze its table format. First you see the name, then you see six fields that have a period at the end, which are for the base stats. Then you see the types fields. Similarly to what we did with the natures table in the previous demonstration, you'll see each Pokemon's type represented by enums instead of raw numbers. And I can edit the types however I want. For instance, I'll make the Ekans line poison dark. I replaced one of the poison enums with the number 17, which is the ID for the dark type. Or I can simply type the word dark to do the same thing to Ekans. You can do the same for abilities and held items. Now I will direct you to the EVs field. Although there is a colon so that only two bytes are reserved, I can fit six different numbers that do different things in those two bytes via a tuple. So here's a quote unquote copy of the EVs field. After the colon, there's a vertical bar T to denote a tuple, and each subfield is separated by another vertical bar. There are six for six stats to yield EVs, and each stat name has a colon afterwards. In Hexmunic Advance, a tuple rations out bits in a byte for the subfields. A period after a subfield reserves one bit, and a colon reserves two bits. For the Pokemon Ekans, I can edit its EV yield as if I was editing something like its base stats. Because of the ration, the highest number I can put here for any of the stats is three which is a pair of bits with the value 1. If you look at the hex content viewer, you can hover over the EV yield and you'll see all six numbers crammed into two bytes. Let's talk about the gender ratio field. Instead of showing you the arbitrary numbers, it actually shows you the preset probability of getting a male version of the Pokemon or a female version of the Pokemon. Technically, these are just strings that correspond to particular numbers, and those are defined by, in this case, a list named gender ratio values in your ROM's TOML file, which is automatically generated when you first load this ROM in Hex Manic Advance. I'm going to skip to the table format's last field, the padding field. This field is kind of special. As you see in this column, all of the data is just a gray number, and if you scroll throughout the table tool, you will not see a padding field that is editable. And even if there was, editing this padding field would do nothing to your ROM, unless you did something to repurpose it. This also applies to any field named unused. Back in the trainer table, I'm going to show you something in the anchor text box. So I'm going to scroll all the way to the right until I get to the final Pokemon field. This is a pointer field, but inside the angle brackets, you see some other text, which is grave tpt grave. Following that pointer for Camper Liam, you'll also see the Grave TPT formatting here. This is what's called a nested table. And yes, this trainer format is also a table, even though there are no brackets in the formatting. There are hard-coded fields in this table, such as the IV spread, level, Pokemon species, and the moves. There's also one for held items, which isn't visible right now. Adjusting the fields of the table requires adjusting the trainer's struct type in this case. There are four of them in the game, and there's more information about that in my trainer editing tutorial. Since we have this variance in the formatting for trainer Pokemon loadouts, we don't use brackets in our formatting for those tables. We just use formatting that's more in line with NPC or battle scripts. Here's another trainer in the game 
And here's how his loadout of Pokemon is formatted. Because his struct type is both instead of moves, there is actually an item field that you can customize. This next table I'm going to show you has a similar amount of complexity to it. It's basically a list of menus in the game that some scripts use that involve the player making a decision. There's also a pointer to text, and I can hover over those pointers to show you one island, two island, three island, and so on, and an unused field that we don't care about. Going back to the other table, you can see the count field that's currently set to 4 for this multi-choice item. And if you look at the options field, encased in its angle brackets, you can see the formatting of the nested table. That formatting matches what we just saw here. If I decrease this value to 3 and go back, you'll see that this nested table only has 3 elements in it instead of 4. But the forward slash count bit still stays there. I'm going to link in the description the GitHub page on all of the table formats that exist in Hexmaniac Advance. The next thing on the agenda is showing you where all of the tables are in your TomL file, which is the file that contains all of the metadata of your ROM. Let's look at the Pokemon data table again. I need to stress that there is nothing in the ROM itself that indicates the name or the formatting of this table. As far as loading your ROM into an emulator is concerned, all of these values are just raw numbers that the game knows what to do with them. Each file that's loaded in Hexmaniac Advance has a corresponding TomL file, which has all of the metadata that Hexmaniac Advance uses in order to actually give the tables formatting that is easier to interpret. So now I'm at the folder that contains my ROM. You're seeing me hover over the ROM that was just opened in Hexmaniac Advance. And now you're going to see me hover over my TomL file. Both files have the same name, with the exception of the extension. TomL files can be opened with any text editor, such as Notepad or Notepad++. These files have a lot of text in them, because they contain the formatting of every single piece of data that Hexmanic Advance knows how to format, including tables, table groups, and enumerations, which are basically numbers that have text associated with them. I'm going to jump to the entry that contains the formatting for the Pokemon table that we looked at a couple of times. You can see the name of the table, its formatting, and where the table is in the ROM. And by scrolling to the right, I'm going to direct your attention to the gender ratio field. After the period, you see the words gender ratio values. We can actually locate that list of strings in the TomL file. Here we are. You can edit these values as you please. Now let's reload the ROM in Hexmanic Advance with our new TomL changes. Here's the change in the gender ratios list. Let's take a break for now. This tutorial is getting pretty long, and I still need to cover a few more objectives. There is a second part to this tutorial that will build off of what I covered in the first part. So stay tuned. Either way, I hope you like this tutorial so far, and I'm looking forward to creating more Hexmanic Advance tutorials for you all to make use of. This is Starstruck Shiny, and I will see you in a bit.